As Bonnie mentioned, my name is Rhonda Patrick, and I am going to talk a little bit this evening about how your diet and your lifestyle can interact with your genes. This is called nutrigenomics. How your diet and your lifestyle can change the expression of your genes. This is called epigenetics. And this is really imp this, this interaction between diet and gene is very important because it helps us understand how we can design a diet and lifestyle strategy to help us age the best way that we can. So this is your metabolism. It's <laughs> very complicated. And there are thousands of metabolic pathways just like this inside each and every cell, inside each and every organ in your body. And these metabolic pathways are what is allowing each organ in your body to do its function, whether we're talking about your immune system and fighting off an infection, or we're talking about your heart, being able to pump blood throughout your body and give all sorts of goodies to various organs, including your brain. So it's your metabolism and your metabolic pathways that allow you to be alive. They are running you, essentially. And these metabolic pathways Many of them require micronutrients as cofactors, which means they need them to function properly. Micronutrients are about 30 to 40 essential vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and fatty acids. And many of these, about 22% of all the enzymes in your body, need a micronutrient as a cofactor to work properly. So micronutrients we get from our diet, and there have been recommended daily allowances, RDAs that have been set, to ensure that we get at least the adequate amount of these micronutrients to make sure that we're running most of these metabolic pathways okay most of the time. But not all the people are meeting the RDAs. For example, magnesium. 45% of the, the US population does not meet the requirement for magnesium, which is between 350 milligrams to 400 milligrams a day, depending on your, uh, if you're male or female. And Magnesium is found at the center of a chlorophyll molecule. Chlorophyll give plants their green color. So green plants are high in magnesium. Spinach, kale, um, these are all very high in magnesium. Magnesium is required for over 300 different enzymes in the body, including the enzymes that are important for using and producing ATP. You actually cannot use ATP unless there's a magnesium bound to it. So if you're not getting enough magne magnesium, this is impairing a lot of metabolic pathways in your body because ATP is the energetic currency of the cell. In addition to that, magnesium is required for uh, enzymes that repair damage to your DNA. It's required for enzymes that are important for making connections between neurons, which is how your neurons communicate with each other and how we form a memory. So magnesium is hugely important for many different processes in the body. But as I mentioned, 45% of the population is not getting enough magnesium. And to complicate things even more, we're all different. So you and I, we all have the same genes, but we have different versions of those genes. They're, they're called gene polymorphisms. So gene polymorphisms refers to just a single change in one nucleotide in the DNA sequence of a gene that can alter its function. Gene polymorphisms make us members of a group people with brown hair and brown eyes, or people with blonde hair or blue eyes. So these, these alternative forms of genes can give us a certain phenotype, like hair color or eye color. But they can also give us a disease risk. They can make us more susceptible to Alzheimer's disease or less susceptible to Parkinson's disease and cancer. They can also change the way our body metabolizes and use micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, and macronutrients, like fat, as well as the way our body can inactivate certain xenobiotics, which are foreign to our body. They're chemicals that are found in the environment that are not normal to our body, and that could potentially even cause cancer. So I'm going to talk a little bit about gene-diet interactions in this first part of my talk. Back to the magnesium. So I mentioned 45% of the population does not meet the ad adequate uh, requirement for magnesium. Well, there's a uh, pretty common gene polymorphism in a gene called TRPM6. And this gene is important for transporting the magnesium that we get from our diet from outside of the cell to inside of the cell. So it plays a very important role because there's three, over 300 different enzymes in the body that are using magnesium. 
People with this particular gene polymorphism don't do it as well. So their magnesium's not getting inside the cell as well as people that do not have this gene polymorphism. In fact, people with this gene polymorphism that have magnesium intake below 250 milligrams a day have a twofold increased risk of type 2 diabetes. So you combine that with eating a diet that's high in refined sugar, low in micronutrients, and it's sort of like a you know, ticking time bomb for type 2 diabetes. But there's a simple solution. You can eat your greens. About two cups of cooked spinach have around 312 milligrams of magnesium, which is almost meeting the daily requirement. So not only are you getting your magnesium, but you're also getting folate, which is very important for making new DNA. You're getting vitamin K, one, which is important for blood clotting. You're getting lutein and zeaxanthin, which uh, are important for protecting the rods and the cones in your eye. They play a role in preventing age-related macular degeneration. So eating your greens, and you're getting fiber, which is really good for your gut microbiome, which is regulating all sorts of things, including your immune system, brain function. So eating your greens is really like just eating a whole bunch of really good things that are good for all these you know, different biological processes in your body. Gene polymorphisms also change the way we metabolize certain types of fat. So there are different types of fat. There's monounsaturated fat, which is um, found high in olive oil, avocados, nuts. Um, there's polyunsaturated fat, which is found high in fatty fish, like salmon, mackerel, herring, and also high in nuts. And then there's saturated fat, which is found in dairy products, like cheese, butter, um, and fatty meat, like pork. Well, there's certain gene polymorphisms in a, very, in a gene called PPAR gamma. PPAR gamma is a master regulator of fatty acid metabolism and also of glucose metabolism. It regulates, it increases lipid metabolism, it increases adipogenesis um, in adipose tissue, it increases insulin sensitivity in muscle tissue, and in the liver it increases something called gluconeogenesis, which is how your body makes sugar when you don't give it um, the precursor, the carbohydrate, um, to make the sugar. Well, a certain gene polymorphism in this gene changes the way it interacts with different types of fat. And people that have it, if they have a very low poly and mono unsaturated fat intake and a very high saturated fat intake, they actually have a much higher risk of being obese and type 2 diabetic. But when their fat content comes mostly from mono and poly unsaturated fat and to a lesser extent from the dairy and the fatty uh, red meat like pork, they have a normal type 2 diabetes risk in the background of all other uh, food intake. So people with this particular gene polymorphism, it's probably better off for them to make sure their fat sources are coming from fatty fishes, nuts, avocados, olive oil, as opposed to getting it from dairy and butter and cheese, things like that. Also, there are very common gene polymorphisms in a gene um, that help inactivate certain compounds that are formed when you cook meat at high temperatures. So any meat, fish, chicken, red meat, anything that's you know, made of protein, when you cook it at a really high temperature, like when you fry it or when you barbecue grill it, what happens is the proteins, the amino acids in those um, proteins interact with carnitine and sugar and the high temperature, and they form something called heterocyclic amines. Heterocyclic amines uh, can form carcinogens in the body, and this has been shown in you know, dozens of animal models. It's been, shown, it's been associated with cancer in humans. But the good news is humans have a gene that can inactivate these heterocyclic amines. So that's really cool if you want to cook, barbecue your meat, grill your meat. Um, your body can take care of that. Your body can handle it. It's got a gene called NAT2 that can inactivate these heterocyclic amines by adding a compound onto it called N-acetyl. An N-acetyl group gets added on to this heterocyclic amine, becomes inactive, and therefore it cannot form something that is carcinogenic in the body. However, people, and there are very common gene polymorphisms, um, I've seen them quite often, that uh, people have a very slow activity of NAT2. And so when they're eating a very high volume of meat that is fried or barbecue grilled you know, every day, uh, you know, there's certain heterocyclic amines that will not get inactivated, and they can become carcinogenic. So the bottom line is, if you have these gene polymorphisms in the NAT2 genes, probably you're better off baking your fish, baking your chicken, not barbecuing, you know, four times a, a day, and not pan frying your, your meat, uh, you know, four or five times a day. Um, so, and I think this also explains a lot of the complexities in 
the clinical trials in nutrition where there's been a lot of studies that have linked, for example, eating cooked meat with cancer, and there's been studies saying, no, it's not linked. And I, you know, I think that as tools become cheaper and we start to look at different gene polymorphisms, we're going to start to sort of tease out this information and go, oh, it's those people with this certain gene polymorphism that can't inactivate that stuff that can form a carcinogen that are more susceptible to cancer when they eat cooked meat. And the people that don't have it, well, they can eat the cooked meat because their bodies can handle it. Vitamin D, um, there are also very common gene polymorphisms in vitamin D. Vitamin D, despite its name, actually gets converted into a steroid hormone. And it regulates over a thousand different genes in the human body. Just to give you an idea, that's about roughly 5% of the protein encoding the human genome. It's a lot of, of genes. So the primary source of vitamin D is UVB radiation from the sun, which hits your skin, and you convert something in your skin called 7-dehydrocholesterol into vitamin D3. A lot of processes uh, are regulated by this. So for example, if you have aging, so aged people cannot do this very well. Skin color, so melanin, which protects us from the burning rays of the sun, also um, prevents UVB from allowing us to convert 7-dehydrocholesterol into vitamin D3. Also where you live, latitude. So depending on where you live, not so much of a problem here in Ocala, but in more northern um, United States, you know, northern latitudes, you, don't eat, you can't even make vitamin D you know, six months out of the year. So lots of uh, different things that can regulate the ability of your skin to make vitamin D. Once you make vitamin D3 in the skin, it's, it's given, uh, it's, it goes into the bloodstream. From there, it goes to the liver, where it's converted into 25-hydroxy vitamin D, and then to the kidneys, where it's then converted into active steroid hormone. Well, there are common gene polymorphisms in the gene that encodes an enzyme called CYP2R1. And this enzyme converts vitamin D3 into 25-hydroxy vitamin D3, which is the major circulating form of vitamin D. And it, this, this polymorphism uh, enables, or it basically changes the function of this enzyme so that it's not doing it very well. So you're not actually converting vitamin D3 into 25-hydroxy vitamin D very well. And people with this gene polymorphism have a two-fold higher risk of vitamin D deficiency. They have a higher all-cause mortality, so they die sooner um, from all sorts of non-accidental diseases like cancer, neurodegenerative disease, cardiovascular-related diseases than people that don't have this gene polymorphism. And they also have a two-fold higher risk of multiple sclerosis. So uh, lots of you know, increased disease risk for people that have this gene polymorphism most likely because they never get their vitamin D levels tested and don't realize, oh, I'm vitamin D deficient. Even though I'm supplementing with a, a vitamin D3, I'm still not making enough of the active form of vitamin D, which is the steroid hormone. So you can actually get your blood levels tested, and, and I highly recommend that. I think that getting your, your vitamin D levels measured and tested is, is very important to do for all people of all ages. Um, the National Endocrine Society considers vitamin D deficiency to be below, blood levels of 25 hydroxy vitamin D below 20 nanograms per mil, considered to be inadequate at levels below 30 nanograms per mil, and adequacy is considered somewhere between 30 and 60 nanograms per mil. So uh, there's a real sweet spot in terms of how much vitamin D you want. You don't want to be deficient, you don't want too little, but you also don't want too much. And studies have shown, uh, meta-analyses have shown that people that have blood levels of vitamin D between 30 and 60 nanograms per mil have a lower all-cause mortality. Um, so too much vitamin D, not good. Too little, not good. Around 1,000 IUs of vitamin D per day can raise blood levels by 5 nanograms per milliliter in people without that gene polymorphism. People that have the gene polymorphism in the CYP2R1 gene may actually have to take a much higher dose of vitamin D, but you won't know that unless you get your blood levels of vitamin D measured. <coughs> vitamin D does regulate the aging process. So these, these mice here are the same age. The mouse on the right has had normal levels of vitamin D throughout its four months of life so far. And the mouse on the left has been genetically engineered um, to not be able to respond to vitamin D. So it's essentially vitamin D deficient. And these are the same mice four months later. So vitamin D deficiency dramatically accelerates the aging process in, in mice. So it's not only aging the skin and you know, the, the hair is falling out, but the organs are also aging faster. So you know, not getting vitamin D can cause a, a rapid aging phenotype. 
Um, and, and like I said, there have been studies that have shown that people with gene polymorphisms in vitamin D related genes like CYP2R1 um, that have lower levels, genetically have lower levels of vitamin D3 because their body isn't converting vitamin D into the active steroid hormone very well, they have a higher all cause mortality. So I'm going to talk just to, briefly on some of the research that I've been doing at Children's Hospital that has uh, to do with vitamin D. So I found that one of the genes that vitamin D is regulating is a gene that encodes, codes for an enzyme called tryptophan hydroxylase. And this is the rate limiting enzyme in the production of uh, converting L-tryptophan into serotonin. Most people, view, most people here probably think of serotonin as being a neurotransmitter that regulates mood, the way we feel. You've probably heard about it in the, in the popular media. Uh, but it actually does so much more. And what's really interesting is that humans have two separate tryptophan hydroxylase genes, TPH1 and TPH2. And these genes are found in different tissue. tissue. So tryptophan hydroxylase 1 is predominantly found in the gut, and it converts all the tryptophan from the protein you eat in your diet to serotonin in the gut. And the serotonin made in the gut does not cross over the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain. Serotonin in the gut plays a very important role because platelets in your blood take it up. Platelets can't make their own serotonin, but they need it because serotonin plays a very important role in platelets aggregating together, which is important for when you injure yourself, you have a wound, you cut yourself, your platelets aggregate, and you want to make sure that you have a clot there so that you don't you know, bleed out. So the serotonin made in your gut plays a very important role in, in making sure platelets are getting their serotonin. However, too much serotonin in the gut actually causes gut inflammation, and I'll get to that in just a minute. The other gene that humans have is the same gene, but it's just a little bit different, a little bit of a different sequence, and it's in the brain. And it converts all the tryptophan that gets into your brain into serotonin. And in the brain, serotonin is doing a lot of things, which I'll talk about in a minute. But what my research identified is that these two separate genes, the one in the gut and the one in the brain, both have a little telltale sequence in them that vitamin D, when it binds to the vitamin D receptor, is able to recognize. And what was very interesting was that the gene in the gut contained a sequence that's consistent with turning that gene off, uh, making sure that not too much of it's being active so that it's not doing its function. Uh, very readily, whereas the one in the brain, TPH2, had a sequence consistent with activation for turning it on so that the trypt more tryptophan is being converted into serotonin in the brain. And um, since I've published this paper uh, early in 2014, another independent group uh, out of the University of Arizona has validated some of this work and have shown uh, very elegantly biochemically that vitamin D does indeed activate tryptophan hydroxylase 2, it increases mRNA, and you're making more, making, theoretically, you should be making more serotonin in uh, several different types of neurons. So what my research identified was that vitamin D may be regulating serotonin production in different tissues in opposite directions. In the gut, it could be turning down that gene, so you're not making so much serotonin in the gut, which is really important, because too much serotonin in the gut causes gut inflammation, because it activates a variety of immune cells in the gut and causes them to proliferate and make more. Um, and it's been shown in several different mice, uh, mouse models that have, for example, colitis or irritable bowel syndrome. When they delete that gene, TPH1 in the gut, and prevent it from making serotonin, the, uh, this ameliorates the symptoms of colitis. So the colitis goes away um, and the GI inflammation resolves. So vitamin D may be important for turning that down in the gut and turning it on in the brain. And you want to have serotonin in the brain. You want to make serotonin in the brain. So vitamin D may be doing two separate things to two separate genes in different tissues, and it's regulating in opposite directions. So like I said, serotonin is doing so much more in the brain. Um, it's not just regulating mood, but serotonin also is very important for impulse control, for social behavior, for mood, for anxiety, and memory. Um, many different studies have been done by a variety of behavioral scientists and um, neuroscientists that have shown that you can actually take a person, a normal person, and you can deplete them of the tryptophan that gets into their brain. And now remember, tryptophan has to get into your brain to make serotonin. You can deplete them of their tryptophan, and what happens is people become very impulsive. Um, their long-term thinking shuts down, they get anxious, um, they get depressive, 
So you know, all these, these, things, these processes are sort of going wrong when you can't make serotonin in the brain. And I published a paper in, in early 2014 that related the vitamin D regulation of serotonin to autism. And I gave several different um, reasons for this, which I don't have time to get into tonight, tonight, but I just want to talk about a couple of them. One has to do with the fact that during early brain development, serotonin is actually what's called a brain morphogen because it actually shapes the structure and the wiring of the brain. It tells neurons in the developing fetal brain where to go, and it tells them what types of neurons to become. And it's been shown multi by multiple different methods, by deleting uh, genes that are important for producing serotonin, and also by pharmacologically inhibiting serotonin during early fetal development in animals, that this disrupts the structure and the wiring of the brain when you can't make serotonin. So if you know, a, an infant, which is a developing fetus, which is entirely dependent on the maternal levels of vitamin D, meaning it, it has to, it, it's relying on whatever levels of vitamin D its mother has. And if vitamin D is very important to make serotonin in the brain, then if a mother is deficient in vitamin D, it's possible that developing brain isn't getting enough vitamin D to activate that gene that's very important for making serotonin in the developing brain. And it's, and it's possible that in combination with other gene polymorphisms that regulate serotonin, because those have been shown to be associated with autism, that that's the perfect storm where you have someone who's already genetically susceptible to low serotonin, and on top of that, they're not getting their vitamin D, they're not getting the nutritional input to activate uh, the serotonin pathway. That may be sort of the perfect storm for abnormal brain development. I also related this to the other TPH enzyme in the gut. Um, and not only is it made in the gut, but it's also made in the placenta. So maternal autoantibodies have been, mothers of autistic children uh, are four times more likely to have autoantibodies in their blood against fetal brain proteins. And it's been shown experimentally um, in monkeys that if you cause an autoimmune response against these fetal proteins in the brain, uh, in the developing fetus, that monkeys' brain structure uh, is abnormal, it develops abnormally, and monkeys actually develop sort of like autistic-like behaviors, and a lot of this work has been done out of UC Davis. And so what I'm thinking is possible uh, because tryptophan can be converted into serotonin by TPH1 in the placenta, it can also be converted into something called kynurenine in the placenta, which is essential to make something called T-regulatory cells. T regulatory cells are a type of immune cell that regulate uh, your body's autoimmune response. So they basically, when you make more of those, they tell your body, okay, you know, the, the tissues in my body are mine, don't attack it. Um, this is a big problem when you have a developing fetus because your body goes, whoa, what's that? That's foreign, get rid of it, get rid of it. Um, and having these T regulatory cells are what tell your body, no, don't, leave it alone, it's supposed to be here. So it's really important to have those T regulatory cells. Well, what's really interesting is that tryptophan has, it binds to this enzyme TPH1 three times um, tighter than it does I, to this other enzyme IDO, which is really important for making kynurenine. So it's possible that if you don't, if you're getting, um, if you're not getting enough vitamin D, which has been shown, you know, to maybe, which we think represses that gene, that it's possible that you're not getting enough of these T regulatory cells because too much of have, too, having too much expression of TPH1 may act as a tryptophan trap and may cause all the tryptophan to be converted into serotonin in the placenta and not enough of it is forming kynurenine in these T regulatory cells. And that could lead to an autoimmune response and prote uh, potentially abnormal brain development. And this has been shown in mice, um, which have been deleted, they have deleted this enzyme, um, IDO, and therefore they cannot form kynurenine, T regulatory cells drop, and female mice that then become pregnant have such a strong autoimmune response that they actually abort the fetus. Um, so this is all research that needs to sort of be teased out and done, but it's a, it's a potential hy hypothesis to be tested. And there's huge relevance for prevention here because all you really need to do is make sure that a mother that's you know, gonna be expecting to have a child um, get her vitamin D levels tested. Make sure she's getting enough vitamin D. And you know, vitamin D costs a penny a pill. So it's a really simple solution to take a vitamin D supplement. Make sure you're within that adequate range of vitamin D. All right. So that was autism. That was some of my research that I'd done with Bruce. 
at Children's Hospital in um, Oakland. And I did a follow-up study, um, sort of adding on my previous work on how vitamin D increases serotonin to include omega-3 fatty acids. Um, the marine omega-3 fatty acids, eicosapentaenoic acid, EPA, and docahexaenoic acid, DHA, and how these also may relate to serotonin and to brain function, to ADHD, impulsive behavior, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, a variety of uh, brain dysfunctional disorders. So I mentioned how vitamin D is important to make serotonin in the brain. Well, EPA is very important for releasing serotonin from a presynaptic neuron because it inhibits something called E2 series prostaglandins, which inhibit the release of serotonin from presynaptic neurons. So if you, if you, take, if you have enough EPA, it will make sure that serotonin is being released from a presynaptic neuron. DHA, the other marine uh, omega-3 fatty acid that's found in fish, is very important for the serotonin receptor, which is how serotonin exerts all its functions. You have to have serotonin binding to its receptor for, in order for us to, to feel anything. So the serotonin receptor, the structure of it, depends on having a certain um, fluidity to a neuronal cell membrane. And DHA plays a very important role to that fluidity of the cell membrane. And it's been shown that when, DHA is, when there's DHA deficiency, that neuronal cell membrane changes, and so does the serotonin receptor. So serotonin is very, uh, DHA is very important for serotonin to bind to that serotonin receptor. And I talk about in this paper how low vitamin D low EPA and low DHA intake, so if you're not eating your fish, you're not getting enough vitamin D, vitamin D is also found in fish, then you may have you know, problems with serotonin production and function. And in combination with gene polymorphisms in serotonin receptors, serotonin transporters, genes that make serotonin like tryptophan hydroxylase 2, which have all been linked to a variety of neuropsychiatric disorders, um, that people, and on top of that, if they're not getting enough of their marine omega-3 fatty acids, they're not getting enough of that vitamin D, they may ha be having serotonin dysfunction in their brain. And so, you know, making sure people eat enough fish or taking a fish oil supplement, taking a vitamin D supplement are pretty simple solutions to at least help alleviate the part that we have control over, which is not the genetic part, but the part that we know certain dietary factors can regulate these different biological processes that are controlling serotonin. So what's the take home here? I just told you, I dumped a bunch of information on you, told you all about these gene polymorphisms all these cool ones, well, I want to know if I have the ones with mag, you know, that's affecting my magnesium or the ones that's affecting you know, different types of fat or my heterocyclic amines or my vitamin D. Well, there's a company called 23andMe, and 23andMe is um, consumer, you know, it's available to consumers. It costs around $199. They send you a kit. You get the kit. You spit in a tube. And after you spit in the tube, you send the tube back off to their lab, and they'll sequence a variety, thousands of different gene polymorphisms that you have you know, in your DNA. Um, and they'll tell you some things about it. They don't really give you in-depth health, health reports. But there's another tool that's called Prometheus that you can use that costs about $5. And they interpret many of these um, gene polymorphisms. They, in scientific terms, sort of tell you, oh, well, this is associated with this. This is kind of what this may mean. But in addition to that, I've developed a tool that I'll be releasing very soon that also lets you export your 23andMe data into my tool, and it will also tell you what it means and what sort of dietary um, solution or environmental di lifestyle solution to, to, that may help you deal with this uh, gene polymorphism. And I'll be releasing that on, on my website, foundmyfitness.com, and also my newsletter you can sign up for. I'll be talking about when I release that. And I also talk about, I explain how to use 23andMe and Prometheus and things like that if you're interested. Okay, so next part of my talk. I've been talking all about how these different changes in the sequence of DNA um, make us all different, different, but also make us members of a group. So gene polymorphisms make us different, but also make us members of a group. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about changing how much of a gene you make. We call that changing the expression of your genes. So different factors in your lifestyle, different dietary factors, different micronutrients, stress, how much sleep you get, um, how hot you are, how much you exercise, all these things can change um, certain factors, epigenetic factors, and that can sit on top of your DNA and they can turn a gene on, they can make it more active, make it do what it's supposed to do so you're doing more of it, or they can turn a gene off so that the gene is not active, it's there, but it's almost as if, as if it was not there because it's really not doing the function that it's normally supposed to do. 
And like I said, these are regulated by our environment, by what we eat, uh, by how much we eat or how little we eat, how much stress we're under. But the really interesting thing about epigenetics is that these epigenetic marks, they actually hitchhike on to the sperm DNA and the egg DNA, and they can be passed on to the next generation. They can be passed on to your children and even to your grandchildren in some cases. So I want to highlight um, sort of a really good example of this that was done in, in um, animals, it was done in mice. So this was done a few years ago. Uh, this study came out of Australia. And uh, researchers fed male mice a very inflammatory diet. It was a diet that was high in corn oil, um, high in sugar, it was a terrible diet. The mice became obese and they got, you know, they got type 2 diabetes, so they became insulin resistant. Big surprise. I mean, most of us know that obesity is associated with uh, type 2 diabetes. But what was really interesting is that these male mice had female offspring that were fed a normal diet. And those female offspring did not become obese, but they developed type 1 diabetes. So why is that? Why did they were fed a normal diet? Why did they develop type 1 diabetes? Well, it turns out that this diet, this high inflammatory diet that these male mice were fed, caused an epigenetic mark called a methyl group to go on top of the sperm DNA next to a gene that's important for creating insulin in the pancreatic beta islet cells. It, turned, it sat on top of that gene and it turned it off so that it wasn't working even though it was there. And that sperm DNA then made up a new mouse. And so the, new, the female mouse had this gene that had this little mark sitting on top of it that was turning it off. So it, this, the female mouse was unable to make insulin and that's type 1 diabetes. So pretty, pretty interesting study. And uh, you know, dozens and dozens of studies have been you know, published since then, have come out showing mechanistically certain dietary factors, environmental factors being exposed to stress early on. These things can be passed on to offspring that haven't been exposed to that stress, like a loud noise, you know, combining it with a smell, for example. You know, then you have a female, I mean, then you have a, an offspring, and that animal then all of a sudden hates the smell of whatever it is, but it's never been exposed to it. Why does it get anxious? So there's things that are regulating, um, you know, genes in sperm and also in egg DNA that are getting passed on. So what about humans? Very recently, in fact, earlier this month, in December, a study was published in the Journal of Cell Metabolism, where some investigators uh, wanted to sort of look at humans to see if they could see, you know, if any of these epigenetic changes were happening in humans. So they recruited a very small population of overweight and obese men, and they took a sample of their sperm DNA, and they compared it to sperm DNA from aged-matched um, lean men. And what they found was that the sperm DNA from these obese men had all sorts of epigenetic marks, these methyl groups, in places that weren't there in the lean men. It was totally different. In fact, over 9,000 different genes were different. And this is, this is called the methylome, kind of a complicated science word, but really it's just these epigenetic factors were different in over 9,000 different genes. So these men then underwent bariatric surgery, so they lost a ton of weight like that. And their sperm DNA was collected one week after and then one year after the bariatric surgery. And what was very interesting about this study was that one week after the surgery, the epigenetic marks in the sperm DNA had changed in over 1,500 genes. And a year later, it had changed in over 3,000 genes. And it was beginning to look more like the signature of a lean person. So just the weight loss itself totally changed all these epigenetic factors, which again, like we just talked about, changes function of genes, like in the case of not making enough insulin in your pancreatic islet, beta islet cells. Um, it changed it in the sperm DNA. So it's a very prov provocative study that uh, suggests that this also may be happening in humans as well. Um, you know, so epigenetics is a very interesting field. Um, you know, it's also been shown to be associated with the way we age. And I'm not going to talk about this tonight, but there are unique epigenetic signatures that happen when we age. Um, and it's very interesting because they're so correlated to age that scientists can take a blood cell out of you and not know your age, they can, don't even see you, just they get the blood sample and then they can identify your age plus or within five years, plus or minus. So they can look at just a blood cell, 
and look at these epigenetic marks on your blood cell, on your DNA and your blood cells and go, oh, that person's probably around 55 years old. And they'll be pretty accurate, 96% accuracy, actually. But I am going to sort of shift gears from epigenetics, and I just want to touch on some of my clinical research that I've been doing at Children's Hospital. So I, we were talking about obesity and how obesity can have negative effects on sperm DNA. Well, it also has negative effects on the individual itself. Uh, so obesity increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. It increases the risk of type 2 diabetes. Um, but what most people don't realize, it also dramatically increases the risk of most cancers, in fact, by twofold. Uh, it also increases the risk for neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease. And obesity can take seven years off the lifespan. And in extreme morbid case, uh, cases, it can take 14 years off lifespan. 14 years is a long time. That's a long time to take off your life um, just from being morbidly obese. So the obesogenic diet, um, as I like to call it, uh, consists of, it's a diet that is very low in vegetables. It's very low in micronutrients and in fiber, and it's very high in refined carbohydrates. It's very high in processed foods, packaged foods, you know, foods in cans, uh, breads, you know, just refined processed foods, uh, you know, and also processed meats. Uh, so this type of diet, I mean, there's all sorts of con uh, consequences with having a diet like this, and it is extremely complicated, and I'm not going to get into any of that stuff. I'm just going to totally simplify it here. But a diet like that causes a lot of damage in the body for multiple reasons. And this damage that's generated um, mostly from your mitochondria that are not working properly, they're leaking out something called reactive oxygen species. Um, it's activating your immune system, um, which are making something called reactive nitrogen species. And these things are damaging your cells, the lipids in your cells, the proteins in your cells, the DNA in your cells, which is then causing more acti immune activation. And it's this vicious cycle of more and more damage. Um, and it, like I mentioned, it, it damages your DNA. And it can cause double-stranded breaks in your DNA. And these double-stranded breaks are a biomarker for aging. They're a biomarker for cancer. And so that, what they do is they cause cells to become senescent, cells to, which means the cell just, it's not dead, but it's not alive. It's just kind of sitting there, and it's secreting bad stuff that's causing more inflammation. Um, or it can cause cells to become abnormal. And these abnormal cells can eventually lead to cancer. So it's really a biomarker for aging and cancer. And I've been, study, I've been looking at double-stranded breaks in, in obese people, but the way I'm measuring it, so this, this break in your, double, in your DNA, it's a double-stranded break, which is the worst kind of break. It's really, really hard to repair a double-stranded break because it's happening in both strands of your DNA at the same time. Um, the way that I'm measuring it is by measuring something called gamma H2AX, which is what happens, the first signaling event that happens when the, your DNA strands break is that uh, your, this protein called histone A2X becomes phosphorylated, and that's called gamma H2AX. And it magnifies over like kilobases of DNA. And the reason this happens is because it's, it's like a molecular beacon. It's a signal, signaling to your cells going, hey, hey, there's a problem here. We got damage. We need to fix this now. And so this serves as a signal for all these repair proteins, all these you know, things are going to repair that damage. They get recruited to that site of damage, and they fix it up if they can. Um, in some cases, the damage is too much, and they can't do that. But So this serves as a marker for double-stranded breaks, and I'm measuring this in people, in blood cells from people that are obese, overweight, lean. And I'm looking at this gamma H2AX as a marker of DNA damage. And what I'm finding is that people that are overweight or obese and have a BMI of 28 and above have a much, much higher level of these double-stranded breaks in the DNA in their blood cells. I'm looking in their white blood cells compared to people that are lean, significantly higher um, DNA damage, which is really bad because DNA damage, like I mentioned, it's a biomarker for aging. DNA damage is associated with uh, shorter telomeres, which is also a biomarker for aging. It's associated with increased cancer incidence, a variety of different things. DNA damage is not good. So I'm seeing that there's a lot more of this damage in, blood in white blood cells from people that are obese. And in addition to that, I'm looking at the ability to repair that damage. So I induce a known amount of damage in these people um, by giving them ion they're giving their blood cells ionizing radiation. And then I allow the, the blood cells to recover like for six hours and see if it can repair that damage. Um, so I'm looking at that, and I'm also looking at the mitochondrial function at the same time to see 
you know, how the mitochondria are performing when you damage them and when you're looking at an obese versus lean population. We're seeing all sorts of really interesting things um, that I'm not going to discuss tonight. But the bottom line here is that what you eat does much, much more than satiate your hunger. It is providing your body with the right vitamins and minerals and essential fatty acids and essential amino acids that are important for running all those complex metabolic processes that I started my talk with. And these vitamins and minerals and fats and proteins are also interacting with our genes. You know, so it, it, there's a complex interaction going on. So you want to make sure you're feeding your body the right kinds of foods so that you can age the best way you can, so that you can make sure that you stave off as long as you can Alzheimer's disease, cancer, um, you know, cardiovascular disease, and things like that. So this is a kind of a snapshot of my, uh, my diet. I eat a lot of fish. Uh, I like to make homemade chicken bone soup and um, smoothies with kale and spinach and lemons and apples. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for listening, and I'd like to thank my mentor, Bruce Ames, and um, Jay Ramsey, who just recently graduated from UC Berkeley, phenomenal student that's done al almost all of the work um, that I've been doing on DNA damage, and also Daryl Chow, who's a technician that's been working with me, is also phenomenally been uh, helpful in doing a lot of the DNA damage work. So. Some questions, and someone's going to bring a mic around. Okay, you there on the orange shirt? I'm not looking for a shortcut, but uh, if I take a vitamin with um, vitamin D and the magnesium and eat more spinach, will I continue to be healthy? I think, I think eating more spinach is really good and taking a vitamin D pill is really good, but also measuring your blood vitamin D levels is important because, like I mentioned, um, you know, people have polymorphisms that make it so even if they're taking a vitamin D pill, they're still not getting enough vitamin D, and they wouldn't know that unless they measured their vitamin D levels. Okay. On your data with uh, autism patients, um, there's been, there's been some data coming out about infections on uh, pregnant mothers increasing the risk of autism. Uh, when, when in your patients where you evaluated the vitamin D, did they also look for infections during pregnancy to see if that was a concomitant factor as well? So the, the research that I, so the question is, what, did I look at infections to see if cr infections were also correlated with autism? And I just want to clarify that uh, this was not clinical research, so I did not have any patients with autism or mothers of uh, autistic children that I specifically was looking at. I was referring to, with some of the autoimmune, uh, autoimmunity research, I was referring to studies coming out of UC Davis, um, where they had done studies where they caused uh, female monkeys to have a very potent autoimmune response. And I think it was kind of like they were, they were giving them some sort of adjuvant thing that was causing them to have a very potent autoimmune response. And that was then... Um, the, the, the mother's immune system was then attacking fetal brain because it, it was actually getting across the blood-brain barrier and attacking uh, fetal brain proteins, and that was causing abnormal brain development. Um, but but what's, what's interesting is that mothers of autistic children have, you know, are four times more likely to have in their blood, even now, even still, um, autoantibodies against fetal brain proteins. Like, you shouldn't have, as a female, antibodies in your blood against brain proteins. So... Yes, they're in the, in the white shirt, sitting right next to... Yes, you. Right there. There. <laughs> I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Oh, vitamin D. Sublingual? Uh-huh. I'm not familiar with sublingual vitamin oh. D. I'm sublingual with, with, I mean, I'm familiar with sublingual vitamin B12. Um, B12, which is important. Yeah, vitamin B12, because, you know, as you're aging, as you age, it's become, you become um, less capable of absorbing vitamin B12, and so sublingual vi vitamin B12 can bypass um, some of those deficiencies. But vitamin D, as you're older, is important to supplement with because you can't make it in your skin very well. In fact, a 70-year-old uh, makes four times less vitamin D than their former 25-year-old former self. 
So you may think, well, I'm living in Florida, I'm out in the sun, but if you're 70 years old, you may not be getting as much vitamin D as you think you're getting. Okay, right there in the, I think it's purple or purple. Oh, oh got it, okay. <laughs> I wonder if, uh, <clears throat> what, what your view is on when and if we can merge the medical community and government policy more towards nutrition. I'm with you on that one. Yeah, I'm, I, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely more, I'm excited about preventative medicine. I'm excited about, you know, the more we understand about nutrition and the more we understand about how, what an important role it plays in the way we age and having the medical community adopt it and, you know, the, the larger community itself adopt it. It's, it's going to be nothing but good. Maybe we should get someone, should we get someone over here or? Yeah, right there. This is rather personal, but we have a granddaughter that wants to be you. <laughs> and she starts undergrad next year and probably pre-med, but would you have a recommendation on what she should be targeting for maybe even a school for post-grad? What I like to tell people is it's best to target a lab if you're going into the sciences. I mean, so if you're going into the sciences, it's best to target a lab that's doing research that you're interested in. And also for, for someone who's a young, developing, budding scientist, uh, in my opinion, I think one of the most important you know, aspects uh, of training is having someone who is hands-on earlier in your career because you need to learn, uh, you need to learn how to use, use different tools at your disposal to be able to answer interesting biological questions. And if you never, if you're kind of just left to like your own, you know, you know, to just do whatever you want because you're in a really, really big lab and people don't have time for you, you won't get that really fundamental training that I think is so critical for young scientists. Now, as they continue on in their career post-graduate, um, then I think it's more important to have freedom. Uh, but I think that early on, finding a lab that you're interested in and finding one that you're going to have a mentor that's a good mentor, that's hands-on, it's going to give you time and attention. Um, that would be my advice. Yes, there, in the red coat. Blazer, yes. You mentioned two or three self-tests that you can do. Yes. Uh, do those include the uh, vitamin D3 test? And if not, how do you get your D3 tested? Great question. So um, no, they do not include the vitamin D3 test. So the, the 23andMe is a, a test that measures your genetic polymorphisms. Vitamin D3 is pretty standard. I think any clinician, any, any physician, uh, if you ask them, will measure it. In fact, most of them should just be measuring it anyways. Uh, but if you, don't, if you don't have a physician, there's companies um, online that will do it, like Wellness FX is one. They'll allow you to, um, you can look at a variety of different you know, biomarkers and micronutrients, vitamin D is one of them. Um, and there's also soon to be coming a, a kit that you can, you know, at home have on your countertop where you're going to be a little cartridge where you finger prick your blood and then uh, you can measure your vitamin D levels and also other hormones. Uh, but that's coming soon, I think. Yes, right here in the front. Oh, we got someone else in the back first. Okay. When Dr. Ames was here, he told us his team was developing this wonderful nutritional bar that sounded amazing. I want a case of them. Are they out yet? They're not out yet. They're not commercially available yet. They're still, they're still in, in the research part. Uh, but, but they're working hard to get those on the market. So I think we had someone in the front here. Um, it seems like that autism has reached epidemic proportions in what, maybe the last 10, 15, 20 years. Um, something has to be happening if you think that the mothers are affecting the newborn, their, their child that's uh, in utero. Uh, has anything been researched and determined on the environment uh, genetically modified foods, possibly glyphosate that's being sprayed on wheat crops. Yeah, so um, you're absolutely right. Uh, autism rates have climbed by 500% since the 1970s. 
you know, one in 88 children have autism, uh, which is just, it's just, it's, it's growing like exponentially, it's a lot. Um, I don't know much about, you know, these, these uh, environmental pesticides and things like that, but I do know that at the same time that autism has been rising, vitamin D levels have been declining um, because of people that are now wearing sunscreen because of fear of skin cancer, people now inside, kid, you know, playing, playing video games, TVs, technology. So at the same time that autism is rising, vitamin D levels have been dropping. So there's sort of this interesting correlation there um, that's been going on. And, and I do think that the, the effects of vitamin D on regulating serotonin and the very important role serotonin plays in early brain development um, is, is quite compelling. We have time for one more question. Okay, we got here in the white shirt. You, you talk a lot about underutilization of, like you say, you're not getting enough diet, vitamin D, but you also talk about the problem with overconsuming micronutrients. So where is the practical solution for, a, like most people here, um, in trying to correct for not getting enough or getting too much? and, and Respect to that question, what do you think of a multivitamin, the controversy of use and not using that? Okay, so this is a great question. Um, the first part of the question is, well, you know, too much vitamin D is not good, too little is not good, so how do you know how much vitamin D you should be taking? And, you know, the answer to that is obviously based on the information you're exposed to. So getting exposed to talks like this where you have experts coming in telling you, well, between, you know, Getting your blood levels of vitamin D measured is very important, and you should have blood levels between you know, 30 to 60 nanograms per milliliter, and we know that taking 1,000 IUs of vitamin D a day raises your blood levels by 5 nanograms per mil. So you can sort of calculate um, how much vitamin D you need to supplement with. You, sh you should also be able to supplement, and then after supplementing, measure your levels again. Um, so I think that's obviously uh, a, the best approach that you could take is by getting a blood test for vitamin D supplementing with vitamin D and you know, seeing if that's actually raising your levels of vitamin D. And then the second question is, what do I think about uh, the multivitamins and the negative versus positive effects that multivitamins may be having? And I actually address this uh, in one of the videos that I put out there um, on the internet, and it's called the rebuttal to the vitamins are bad. And it's really basically, um, there's, very, there's lots of complications in clinical trials, in nutrition, clinical trials using micronutrients. Many, many, many of the studies do not measure anything, mostly because it's too expensive. So they give people a vitamin D supplement, they give them a multivitamin that has 200 IUs of vitamin D in it, you know, and then they don't measure anything in the blood, and then they're looking at some outcome, clinical outcome of X, Y, or Z. And they say, oh, this clinical outcome of X, Y, or Z is infected, so you know, there's probably no effect that vitamin D or the multivitamin has. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, when you give someone a high dose of certain vitamins, for example, folic acid, um, which is the oxidized form of folate, uh, that folate plays a very important role in uh, making a precursor for your body to be able to make new DNA. So every time you make a new cell, whether that's a cell in your gut or your skin, um, your heart, your liver, you need to make new DNA, which means you need folate because you need to make this precursor for a DNA nucleotide that it's, that it, it's required for. Um, but guess what else makes new cells? Cancer. So if you give someone who already has, for example, a colon polyp, colon cancer polyp, um, a bunch of folic acid that's like fueling the cancer to grow more because you're like, here's more of those precursors you like to make no more cells. Um, but if you give that same you know, dose, I guess folic acid's not the best example because too much of it's not good, but if you give it to people that don't have cancer, it doesn't cause cancer. So it's kind of, it all depends on the, the trial designs, on the study designs, on, and, and they're just, for, for reasons of funding, they're not done well. You know, it's, it's hard to find a clinical nutrition study that is done properly, that has done, you know, well done controls, that looks at blood levels of whatever they're measuring or looks at blood levels of other biomarkers. And also that looks at genetics. So there's, there's a, a new, st a huge, huge trial that's gonna be done on vitamin D and they're gonna look at, you know, like thousands and thousands of people. They're gonna look at supplementing with 2000 IUs 
a day in a variety of different um, genders and ages. And they're going to look at, they're going to measure blood levels of vitamin D. They're going to measure other proteins that regulate vitamin D. And they're going to look at gene polymorphisms. And they're going to start to look at clinical outcomes. And I think that's the way we should be doing clinical trials and nutrition. We should be looking at all these different factors. Right now, it's too expensive. I mean, getting, I'm, I'm doing clinical trials. I'm involved in clinical trials at, at the hospital in Oakland. And, you know, getting blood, measuring all these biomarkers, these things cost a lot of money. And so when you're doing a huge trial and you don't have that money to do that, you sort of don't do it, and instead you just look at a clinical endpoint. So a kind of a complicated answer, um, but it was a complicated question. Well, let's thank our speaker. Thank you.